Let's give people a few more seconds. Actually, no, it's the top of the hour. Let's begin the forum. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a great session on one of the most important topics that we've got with a couple of great guests, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I mean, it's really important to remember that the, the Internet has given us perhaps the greatest single expansion of information and content in human history. It's a truly astonishing amount of stuff that we make and have access to. But at the same time, not everybody has access to all this stuff. It may be for reasons of the digital divide. It may be for reasons of not having physical access, but also has to do with ability and disability. And as a result, we have to think very hard about how to make our digital content accessible to all potential viewers, readers, listeners, and so on. So this week, I'm very, very proud to host a couple of wonderful people. Ray Mancia, who is Assistant Director of Online Learning at, uh, at uh, the University of Pittsburgh, and Barbara Fry, who is a Center Consultant and Instructional Designer, also the University of Pittsburgh. They're the authors of, a, or the editors rather, of a brand new book on digital accessibility, which is now become my go-to tome on how to understand how to make accessibility work in higher education. So without any further ado, let me just start bringing folks up on stage so we can have this conversation. And here we should have coming to us from Pittsburgh, Director Mancia, hello. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's 2 p.m. here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Well, it's very good to see you. And it's a nice t-shirt, because Quality Matters t-shirt. Quality good. Matters. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And where are you today? Where have we found you? I am in my home office that was created pre-COVID. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, it's really, really good to see you. Um, Ray, we have a tradition of people introducing themselves in the forum by describing what they're working on next. Now, what does the next year hold for you? What are the projects and what are the ideas that are uppermost for you? So I, I do come from the land of instructional design, and I would say that I'm always learning. So um, currently, Barbara and I are working together on a series of papers on mentoring for instructional oh. designers. So that's our latest and greatest topic, and we did an extensive data collection, and we'll be sharing out um, hopefully through some publications, our research on the strategies and the needs for um, instructional design professionals. Oh, wow. Oh, that sounds really good. Are you going to be doing any uh, workshops or presentations in that? I sure hope so. We're always happy to do presentations, especially with Quality Matters. Um, I do work with the Quality Matters Instructional Design Association, and um, my colleagues and I do workshops with Quality Matters. And in addition, um, Barbara and I are hoping to put this publication out through a scholarly forum. So uh, it's almost finished. We have a goal for the end of the month to finish our writing, but um, that is our newest uh, research focus. Well, uh, let me know, in uh, all seriousness, once it gets to uh, some new forms that are shareable, and we can bring you back to talk about mentoring. Certainly. Now, hold on right there. Um, I need to bring up to, on the stage uh, your colleague here, uh, Barbara Fry, and let me add her to our discussion. And good afternoon, Barbara. Well, hello. It's nice to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you can join us. Where have we found you today? I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, too. I am in my in my den. Ah, uh, excellent. Door locked, trying to keep it quiet. Well, we'll we'll see what we can do. I'm afraid we're going to be making noises on our end here. <laughs> um, let me ask you the same question that I just asked today, Barbara. What what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big ideas and projects that are uppermost for you? I I guess I'm really really happy with where I am. So I hope for the next. Mm -hmm. Going to be doing the same things that I'm doing now, collaborating with Ray for one. Um, I have um, actually two or three jobs. Uh, after 20 years at the University of Pittsburgh as a senior instructional designer, I am now at Pitt um, part time, and I've been part time now for maybe three, three and a half years. Around the around the beginning of COVID, um, mm. and I love doing that. I love the instructional design work. I am. Um, Oh, I very much respect all the people that I work with, the instructional designers and the multimedia specialists that I work with at Pitt. So I hope I'm still doing that. Um, there is no better way to keep learning than being an instructional designer. Mm -hmm. I, I also teach. I, 
um, I teach with Point Park University in their program for learning design and technology. So I teach one course every semester and I'm active in Quality Matters. I've also got my Quality Matters t-shirt on. Oh, um, brand. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a um, research colleague, a facilitator and a, a peer reviewer. Um, so I've been active with Quality Matters almost since the very, very beginning of the you know, of the FIPSI grants that, that started Quality Matters. Wow. So well, I, this one, I want to. You, you sound it. super busy. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but this is not retirement. Um, no. <laughs> I just wanted more control over things, and I get bored easy, so I'm real happy to have different projects to work on. But in the next year, I want to continue. I, I really want to be an advocate for well instructional design as well as accessibility. I want to do a little publishing, um, a lot of professional development right now. I'm really into this artificial intelligence um, arena, and, and especially as it relates to research and, and the qualitative mm. analysis of Excellent. data. Excellent. That's well, where I am. Well, those are two big themes, especially AI here on the forum. And uh, we, we'd love to have you join us for more conversations of that. Here, let me let me adjust the screen a bit, make things uh, a little bit more balanced. And thank you both for, for joining us. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, the way this usually begins is I ask our guests a couple of really basic, almost dunderheaded questions to give them a chance to really cut loose and explain and explore more about what they're working on. But after I do that, the time is for you to ask your questions and to put forth your ideas and your comments. So as we're going back and forth, see what you think, see what is really you know, connecting for you. And uh, by the way, if you're new to uh, our two guests and their work on the bottom left of the screen, you should see a kind of tan colored box that says guide to digital accessibility. And also another one that's QM digital accessibility white paper series. So you can click on that series and get all kinds of great short documents about accessibility. And of course, if you click on the guide to digital accessibility, you can be taken to the Rutledge page to grab a copy of their book. So to, to begin with, let me just ask, your book goes into so much detail. All of the authors that you've assembled have really given us just clearly written, up-to-date material. I, I like everything from the history of accessibility to all the different examples of policy. Let me ask a broad question right now. First, what's the best way or what are the best ways that you've seen for a college or university to really support accessibility? You know, what can academic institution do to make all this digital stuff accessible for you and your audience? Ray, you want to start? Sure. Um, Brian, I just want to acknowledge while we're here that I see several of the authors from the text Ooh. here. So um, we are not the only experts in this room. I just want to let you all know if there's a question that comes up that you would love to field, uh, you're most welcome to uh, take a stab at it. Um, we did have 23 chapters in our book and 43 different authors. So we are really pleased to see some of you here today um, among other colleagues that we're familiar with. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, in addition, um, in response to your question about institutions, uh, we really believe that creating a policy around digital accessibility is, is critical for starting this work um, at an institutional level, not to discourage the individual who would like to make change within their own department or within their own school. There are, of course, initiatives that you can launch at a school level or a department level um, or as an individual faculty or staff member, um, but to really garner uh, traction, it's important to have policy. So. Um, creating awareness that policy is necessary at the institution, taking advantage of um, national forums like March's National Disability Awareness Month, mm. um, calling those events to the attention of the administration can begin to create uh, awareness about the importance of policy and uh, the importance of making the materials accessible for all. So and that brings funding, typically brings funding. <laughs> So okay. policy and funded policy. Uh, and, and can I jump in? I'm back up a little bit, but digital accessibility, let me just give you our definition because our definition is it's, it's a subfield of web accessibility. And because our background is in online courses, 
and mm -hmm. the book is talking mostly about hybrid and online courses, we're talking about the ability for all students to be able to navigate um, electronic materials in their course. So whether it's video, audio, um, interactives, multimedia, whatever the asset is in the course, we want students to be able to, to access that. So if I go back to actually 2011, mm. Um, mm. a colleague and I did a survey to see how many institutions had accessibility policies. And it was very low. It was something like 13%. And then Ray and I, after 10 years, we just wanted to revisit the topic because accessibility has become a much more prominent topic in the last decade and even a little more. And it was almost a 50-50, meaning that 50% wow. of the institutions had accessibility policies. It was a little less, I don't know, is it 48? Yeah, 48%. And that was in 2019. So that would be pre-pandemic. Right. And, and of the people that did not have a policy, there were 13 percent, 15 percent, something like that. Quite a few were working on a policy. Oh, nice. so, so I think we are making progress in this field. And I you know I hope Ray and I can continue to be advocates for just building awareness of digital accessibility. So, well, that helps a lot to know. Um, I mean, the curve is definitely a positive one. So we can we can take comfort in some progress. Now, one quick question, who usually issues those policies? Is that the, the dean, uh, academic dean level? So traditionally, they really shouldn't be institutional because the institution is held responsible for ensuring that you know, education is accessible. So they should be issued at the level of a chancellor, for example, um, or academic provost. Uh, typically, you would see a policy for an institution. Um, of course, um, at our university, the University of Pittsburgh, um, each school is held responsible for uh, for compliance with the university policy. So there are um, mechanisms in place to ensure that our benchmarks are being met as an institution. Uh, but again, so that typically starts either as some sort of committee. Um, it might come out of the Office of Disability Services. It might come out of um, uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion office um, mm. at the institution. So it really depends. Oh, that, that last one gives me a, a quick question to ask. Um, are you seeing during the most recent wave of anti-DEI policy in many states and universities, is that catching up and weakening campus accessibility offers? Well, certainly not at our institutions yeah. now. No, we are we are not seeing that. It, thank goodness. Oh my gosh! Thank goodness. That would certainly be a step backwards and very upsetting. Yes. I, I think in our institutions we've seen an increase in dedicated personnel um, and expertise um, in the field of digital accessibility, especially as um, positions are opening in digital marketing. For example, there are lots mm -hmm. of uh, crossovers. So as online education just continues to grow. Um, I, I think we see more and more uh, personnel being allocated and the specialization um, needed. Excellent. Excellent. I, I'm seeing in the in the chat, we have uh, one of our friends from Florida who says they don't want to comment on this, and I appreciate this. Um, but I also do want, on another serious note from Florida, uh, Shelby, uh, Katie, and Eileen, please take care in the tornado warning uh, and the flood warning. I, I hope you all are safe. Um, we're recording this, so if you get knocked offline, you can find the recording on YouTube probably within a couple of days. But please be safe, friends. Be safe. Well, well, thank you for answering my 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 first big question. I guess the second big question is, and this is this is about a third of your book, is how do you how can we best support and develop faculty in this? I I would say it's probably true that the majority of faculty emerge from grad school without a trace of practice and um, and accessibility, and they have to work with a wide variety of content coming from other sources that they might not have any control over. Uh, how do you how do you get instructors of all kinds, from adjuncts to tenured full professors, to shape their materials to make them more accessible? We have a chapter that's talk, that talks about um, some keys to um, accessible course development and i think th these address you know some of the things just some proactive things that institutions can do and one of the things that i i think is just a great idea is having 
um, an instructional designer who specializes in accessibility. You know, so maybe a senior instructional designer who just kind of, mm. leads, you know, has extra expertise in accessibility and kind of leads the initiative for that team. Um, so all the instructional designers need to have a strong foundation, but one person who makes it their their job to just stay up to date with everything. That's a great idea. But then, you know, you have to provide training and job aids and templates and tools. All those things have to be readily available for faculty so they don't have to go out and create anything that it's it's already, you know, the, the syllabus for the template is already accessible. And, you know, the faculty member just has to, to fill it in and make it it is um, just as easy as possible as we can for them. And we also have some chapters on professional development. Barb, I would add as well that um, we do see faculty often um, reticent to get involved because they think it's going to take a lot of time and um, perhaps skills that they don't have. So making it accessible to them, the training, um, and we always start with what we would consider low hanging fruit. So we do um, workshops at our institution on uh, basic practices that you can implement. And we, we look at what is um, high impact, low effort, um, what is maybe high effort and we always encourage our faculty start with what will take low effort make some meaningful changes and continue to iterate so um for example uh, changing a hyperlink so that it has a meaningful name um, that is a small change with a great impact um, so we would encourage the faculty members and teach them um, these core practices. And of course, there are some institutions that don't have internal digital accessibility expertise. Um, and there are trainings available on the web. There are third party um, providers that can um, provide a training. So WebAIM also has some fantastic asynchronous modules that you can go through. Um, there are some press books out there. One of our authors, Heather Capret, has a wonderful press book that is free to the public and goes through a myriad of different practices and it's very practical. So in a Word document, what do you need to do to, um, to have a have an accessible document design on a PowerPoint slide. Um, we spend a lot of time teaching our faculty members how to use the, the accessibility checkers um, in the Microsoft suite, as well as in the learning management system. And those checkers are not foolproof, but they've come a long way. And uh, you are able to run those checkers and to identify barriers. And oftentimes there are hints that are provided for improving the accessibility of the content. So it, it is an instructional tool as well for faculty or course developers. Um, lots of people can make use of these tools um, on campus. Oh, great, 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 great. So you know, we have instructional designers, getting some of them to be full-time experts on this. And Barbara, when you were saying that in the chat, Laura Foley typed in, that's become my role. And then right after that, Katie Profeta said, me too, Laura. Um, <laughs> I also think it's important for instructional designers to partner with the Disability Services Office. Um, somebody, I, I signed up for a workshop long ago, way back at the beginning of maybe 20 years ago. And the, and the woman would not let you register for her workshop unless you partnered with somebody from in the instructional design office. And that's how I started. And that's how I started this conversation about, okay, what do you see when you're working with students? What are the big barriers you see at, on, on our campus? And it was, you know, um, PowerPoint, it was PDFs, but I mean, she, she gave me the actual numbers of what were the barriers. So we had a place to start when we were working with faculty. Excellent, excellent. And then you mentioned uh, resource, other resources online. Uh, Ray mentioned, uh, the uh, press book link and uh Arful hulk chenille asked about it and ray answered before i could even get to it put a link to it right there in the chat and uh and then uh, grace hall put a link to uh the guide to accessibility book so we can see that as well but then barbara birch mentioned quality matters accessibility and usability resource site oh, which yes. is right there so we've got a fistful of hyperlinks and there, there, are, there are these lovely volunteers on that um the quality matters website who will answer questions so if you are stuck with something, you can go to that website and post your question and, you know, may not be instantaneous. These are volunteers, but they will get back to you and tell you, okay, here's, here's a suggestion. 
that's beautiful. And I have to say, Brian, that as Barbara and I were working on this book, we came across accessibility questions um, that we were expected to answer because the publisher didn't have all of the answers yeah. at the time. And we yeah. used the R site to tap in and crowdsource as well. So um, there's always more to learn. And we have found ourselves networking with vendors and um, technology companies and providing feedback on tools. And we we felt like we were teaching the publisher about accessible content when we were working on the book. So there is a lot to learn and you can advocate in many different ways. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's a really, really great answer. Uh, both of you answers, thank you both so much. Um, now I, I wanna stop talking so much. And I, I want to uh, point to questions that people have. Um, and uh, one of them came up from our, our, our good friend, Charles Findlay. And let me just put this on the screen. This is an example of a Q&A question. Can you provide some real world experiences of non-accessible and accessible practices in online classes? I think it's real world, not real worth, but um, you know, but examples of non-accessible versus accessible practices. What, what are some examples then? So I, I have one on the top of my head, um, thinking about um, when you are crafting a document and you want to indicate a title. And instead of using a style to do this, you underline the text or you bold the text and you right. um, you might make the font 16 or 18 font um, to, to show that this is a, a distinctive piece of text from the others. However, that's not accessible to a screen reader technology. You would have to use the ribbon in the Microsoft suite or in your editor um, in the learning management system to place um, a heading text to, to be able to semantically structure that text. And, and I see that very often as well as the use of color to convey meaning. So when you want to show this is very important, you might want to highlight it in red or blue. Pit is very blue and gold. We bleed blue and gold. And so everything in our templates is blue and gold. And the faculty love to use these colors to, to highlight and call out. But um, those are not accessible. We would want to show emphasis in, in other ways, for example, using italics or bold text to convey um, emphasis. So those are just a few examples that are kind of top of mind. I'm sure Barbara has more. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, please. And you already mentioned the ribbon, right? So let's stay with that for a second. You, you would want to use all the features in the ribbon. If you're making bullet points, use the feature in the ribbon. Don't just put an asterisk in there and think that that's your oh, oh, oh. or see. dash or something like that. Use the use the features because I know it may look the same to mm -hmm. you, but there is coding behind the scenes that a screen reader reads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to say Roman numerals jump to, to mind. Like rather than using no Roman numerals, use real digits. Or if you have to do an outline, oh. do A, B, C. Because again, think of the screen reader. It's, it's trying to make yeah. work out of that. It's saying if it's Roman numeral one, it's saying I. It's not saying sure. one. Oh. You know, and I'm I'm kind of thinking about. Um, forums such as this like a zoom room or it may be a microsoft teams meeting uh, we often take for granted that users may need captions for um, those meetings so you can enable live transcription you can enable captioning um, so we often see our online courses have a synchronous meeting once a week and um, with in, in conjunction with the disability services, um, we can request a live captioner. Um, faculty can also enable captioning um, and transcription in their meetings. So that's a, a, it's a button. It's pretty easy to push. And sometimes it's just you don't remember to do it or faculty don't oh. know that the, the button is there to select. Um, multimedia are very prominent in online courses. So it's important oh. that in addition to documents, you know, we have accessible multimedia. Oh, those are great examples. Um, and by the way, I mean, I'm just thinking of some of the things I've, I've been trying. I, I blog in WordPress and I've been trying to remind myself to always use the header function. But I, I have years of just, well, I'll make it bold. You know, I have to keep remembering. No, no, I have to, I have to do the header. <laughs> uh, in, in the chat, people have just been on fire. Uh, a, a couple of things I wanted, I wanted to bring up. 
uh, Jennifer Bennett Gentner uh, said, uh, showed a, a link to um, a project. Jennifer, are you in New Zealand right now? Um, if so, good morning. I'm glad to see you there. Um, to a, a, a really interesting publishing document there. Laura Foley adds that headings and lists are the lowest hanging fruit of accessibility. Uh, Jennifer, well, you're in New York, the great publishing city. I'm glad to see you on our time zone. Um, we have a, a, a question from uh, our dear friend, Michael Johnson, uh, who has also been a guest on the program uh, twice now, who asked us this, if you could please speak to the issue of university policies for ensuring accessible content for required textbooks. So what are the university policies that ensure accessible content for required textbooks? I admit I don't have any um, experience in this area. I do have faculty who tell me all the time their, their textbook is not accessible, mm. um, which, which is concerning. But I, I, other than talking to their vendor or their rep, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. I, I really don't have any suggestions for them. And we don't have a policy that I know of. I guess that would go with um, the technology office. That would be under their arena. And I'm thinking about um, our work at the school level in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Um, we were required to provide the VPATs, the voluntary product accessibility templates for all of the tools, including the publishing materials um, at our inst that we were using in our courses to the institution. So I would say that all published publisher materials um, should be vetted um, by the uh, electronic information technology committees um, at your institutions as part of ensuring that the textbook content is is accessible. It, as Barbara mentioned, it's not the first time that we've heard this. We were using a 3D medical um, textbook available through Elsevier. Mm -hmm. And we created a long list of um, inaccessible materials and brought that to the vendor um, to provide product improvement opportunities. So uh, we were told that the 3D videos were, cap were captioned in available um, and accessible formats. And as a result, they were not all um, accessible. Only those that were created by the publisher and not pulled from their third parties oh, oh. Um, and integrated into their materials were accessible. So I would say that the VPAD is an important tool to ensure that the, that the materials being deployed in courses are accessible. I, I do believe that the Office for Disability Services can assist individual students who self-disclose by making their materials accessible, um, but that is more of a case-by-case -case basis and not from a universal design for learning perspective, which is really where we want to be. Interesting, interesting. Just with the faculty I work with, I, I have always gotten the impression that they have the, the final decision on what textbook they use, what right. materials they use, and it doesn't go through the Office of Technology. I don't, I just don't think that is. Oh, no, that shouldn't be. Um, in, 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 the, in the chat, we've had some interesting notes. Uh, Paula mentions uh, purchases on their campus must be vetted for accessibility compliance. Paula, which campus are you at? Uh, Brenda Boyd says that procurement can be involved in acquiring materials. Uh, and Susan points out quite rightly, and this is one thing I was hoping someone would mention, that libraries struggle with this too. Many of the databases they subscribe to have accessibility issues. I keep thinking there's more that regional creditors could do. Um, and uh, Paula's Binghamton. Hello, Paula. I hope you're getting some nice spring there. Um, Bobby Might has to require their materials for accessibility. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit on this. In fact, we have a, Michael asked that question, and let me bring up on stage, because he, he wanted to follow up with this. Um, let's see if he can fit up on stage with us all. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So I, I just wanted to, I appreciate the candor in your response of, hey, I don't know what's going on with the textbooks, because that's outside of your remit, so I, I thank you for that. I want, just wanted to bring up two things. I, I work for Benetech. We're a charity which is focused on making digital content accessible for people with print disabilities. So there's two things that we do that might be useful to, to, to you and to anyone in the audience. The first, we have a program called Bookshare, and there's 1.2 plus million titles in there. They're not all fully accessible, but we apply what accessibility we can to make them more accessible, including being able to translate into digital braille and doing some fonting for dyslexia and things like that. 
this service is free for any educational institution in the United States and any student in the United States. So it should fit in your even even tight budgeting times. Free should still fit in there somewhere. Oh. Um, the other to the publishing folks in the audience or to anyone who wishes to have that difficult conversation with the publishing community, we run a program called Global Certified Accessible, where we actually teach the publishers through an iterative process how to create all their content fully accessible from Jump Street. So from the point of sales and distribution, if you have a GCA certified publisher, then they have adopted their workflow to ensure that every book they're purchasing from that day forward is fully accessible. So it's not a commercial, just a statement. We're a charity anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter. But um, uh, just wanted to let everybody in the community in this call know that there are a couple of options for you. We work with DSOs, certainly, or students can come directly to us individually. So that's it. Thank okay. you, Michael. Any, uh, any questions for Michael from Barbara or Ray? Brian, I just want to say thank you, Michael. And this is a, a, a prime example of how we continue to evolve in this space. There's so much to learn and the new resources that are appearing. It's fantastic for others to share with us as well. Yes, our, our publisher could have used you. <laughs> well, maybe that's a maybe that's a connection to happen. Michael, you had some uh, questions in the chat. You might want to you might want to bounce on, but but thank you and uh, thanks thanks for doing all the great work there for accessibility. Uh, friends, that's an example of a video question. So if you just want to join us on stage, um, as as you can tell, you don't necessarily have to have a beard to be on stage for the program. Um, <laughs> but just uh, just click the raised hand icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, by the way, also in the chat, um, uh, Jennifer Bennett Gintner, I hope I didn't mangle the name too badly, Jennifer, uh, pointed out something really important for software. Um, in general, publishers are working with InDesign, which is a technology is not accessibility friendly based on its built-in cascading style sheets. We're crossing our fingers that Adobe catches up with this and updates InDesign to operate better. That's a great point, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I had not thought about this. Um, we have more questions piling up, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, and this is a really, really good one from uh, from Bill, um, who uh, from sorry from Bill Weber, who asks, "What kind of carrots do you use to get instructors to do accessibility work?" I found instructors are reluctant to recreate materials they've previously created. I, I think the biggest carrot <laughs> comes from the administration. So we did recently launched an initiative and we had to have the backing of the dean who supported the program directors and department chairs in ensuring that um, the faculty were taking part in the initiatives um, but barbara and i have also been involved in several initiatives where we look for student voices and voices of um, people with disabilities who share their experiences and uh, personal experiences with disability and online materials or digital materials. And, and that personalization and that element and understanding why it is so important that they have access um, to the materials can often motivate um, some resistant faculty to start to take the steps. Uh, I mean, truly, we're looking at this as this is an ethical obligation, but it's also a legal obligation. So there mm -hmm. are um, there are compliance components, and of course, it does not have to be a student with a disability who reports inaccessible content. So we have all seen uh, examples of um, high profile lawsuits in this space and um, the results, the ramifications of not making the material accessible. And uh, one of the key components in our unit as we work as instructional design partners with faculty um, is, is them taking ownership of the course. So um, although the instructional designers review materials and consult and can do a range of tasks, uh, the faculty is the face of the course. So that faculty member does become ultimately responsible for you know, the material being accessible and any um, complaints that are registered um, from that course. I usually tell faculty to start with today. I, I really think it's difficult to retrofit a course that's already been designed and you've been changing. Oh. So start with today. From today forward, every time you update a document, um, clone your course, and, and you know, add a new video, from today on, everything you put into your course, you want to make sure it's accessible. But 
you know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about going back to a you know video that you created two years ago and making that now accessible. Let, let's just okay. start with all the new material because it is, it's overwhelming. Some things can be extremely time consuming. And faculty needs support. So um, some of the departments that we work with, they hire um, student workers, they hire interns, um, and they try to assist faculty um, in creating an audit of all of their content. So an inventory for one course, for example. And this time that the course is offered, we're going to work on the PowerPoints. And that those assistants will um, assist in remediating the, remediating the content content in all of those PowerPoints, for example. And then they will continue to iterate so that um, they work toward 100% um, accessible. So supporting the faculty in this process is really, is really critical. I had a faculty member who was pulling her hair out over making a transcript for a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, she had a technology that would convert the audio into words, but then you had to go in and check all the words and the spelling and add the sure. conversation and the paragraphs and all that. You know what? She, she said, the next time I pick a podcast, I am going to be more careful and maybe pick a TED talk mm. or something that does this for me because I don't want to have to do this again. Oh, there's a lot of work here. Um, but th thank you both, and and thank you for the for the really good question. Um, again, if you're if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a Q&A question. Uh, and in fact, we have another video question that's coming from our dear friend, uh, Brent Anders at the American University of Armenia. And let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Brent. Hello, hello, welcome. Good to see you, sir. Good yeah, to see great you. to see you. Okay, so my question is, and I used to work with a lot with uh, accessibility at the previous university I worked at. At my new university, it's kind of a new concept, right? I'm not in the United States, I'm in the country of Armenia. They're slowly starting to understand the importance of this. And one of the things is that my focus now is mainly dealing with AI integration into education. So my question is dealing with AI, generative AI, have you started to look into that as far as how generative AI can be used as a tool for instructors to help with accessibility, as well as the agency that it gives students to be able to do more because now they have generative AI as a tool that can assist them in their learning, that can help them to describe what an image is when an image isn't properly described, that could help them with transcription, that could help them as far as being neurodivergent, as far as explaining things in a different way. AI can do a lot. Have you started to look into that? No, we have not, but you just gave us an idea. <laughs> Um, I mean, we certainly could use um, some AI to to do exactly what you said. You know, here is a, a you know a, a video, or here's a podcast, and can you help with the you know, transcription? Can you help with the you know creating the the subtitles? That's certainly possible. It's certainly going, but it's also going to take a lot of human time because I mean it does make mistakes, and you, you are going to have to go back and, and really check that very carefully. I'm also thinking about the potential for using that with a complex image. So we use alternative text, right, to describe a simple image or we mark it as decorative. But in often, oftentimes we have complex charts. We have, you know, a flow chart or a really detailed image. We deal with anatomical images all the time in the School of Health and Rehab Sciences and detailed processes. So I can imagine asking, um, chat gpt to make a description for me um, that could accompany the image of course as barbara said there would be some review needed but um, I'm, I'm certain that it could help with um, work like that or also tables um, describing really in-depth tables so you know we know that we're not supposed to be merging cells in the tables and uh, of course mm. there are times that we do that um, and we see that in research articles often, especially when someone is presenting their research. So um, maybe using ChatGPT to um, to provide a summary of a very detailed table that could be um, accessible. Yeah, and, and that's I, I think you, you're really hitting it because it's the same thing with what I'm, I'm doing with AI literacy, right? Is I, I'm really trying to work to attack it from both ends. So that means that trying to get the instructors to, to understand this, and then also trying to help the students understand this, because 
if let's say I'm a student and I'm going through a course and my instructor hasn't properly caught up with the disability enhancements that need to be there, well now because of AI as a student, I would have more agency in that I could assist myself. Uh, again, of course, that's not the A answer, but that's still uh, an answer for, for the current situation. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the answer. Well, thank you, Brent. And uh, by the way, uh, Brent asked that question. There were about four other questions along those lines uh, of AI. So I think, Barbara, Ray, you just stepped into a gigantic whirlpool of, of AI. Barbara and thought she was leaving the world of digital accessibility. <laughs> It's the, it pulls you right back in. Uh, in. In the chat, Laura Foley says that she's played with AI for generating alt text for complex images, with some good results and some mixed. Um, and uh, our, our good friend uh, George Station on the West Coast says, as we wrestle with the ethics of AI, the tremendous use of resources, et cetera, it would be great for institutions to consider the impact of bringing AI to the accessibility space. Uh, which I, I think is terrific. Uh, I think there are a lot of parallels here too, because what we see institutions doing in AI is starting to craft policy, beginning to craft policy, maybe a grassroots effort. Um, and, and we saw that with the digital accessibility. And so when we look at like, what will this look like over time? Um, I imagine that we'll see um, policies for AI continue to evolve like we've seen with digital accessibility. Very good. We have a few more questions, and I'm afraid we only have 13 minutes, so I want to make sure that people get a chance to, to answer this. And by the way, everyone in the chat, uh, the resources here are, are terrific. Um, please let me know in the chat if you would object if I uh, blog this. So what I'm what I'm thinking of doing is not only having the recording, but also just going through the chat and, and pulling out all the good bits and then anonymizing it. So um, so if you have any objections to that, please let me know, and I can, I can resist uh, I, I do want to just add about um, alt text for images. I mean, I do, I do think the faculty member has to be heavily engaged in this. They know the purpose of why they put that image in their course. And sometimes it's not just describing the image, it's the purpose of the image. So that has, mm. that has to be considered. I, you know, an image for, I don't know, for a graphic design course might have a very different alt text description than an image, the same image in um, a, a, a economics course. In oh second. yeah. Oh, Barbara, that's brilliant. I, that that's so important. Thank you for saying that. Well, I think you know originally, and then I'm going back 15 years. We we had this brilliant idea of having student workers help with putting alt text into some um, part mm -hmm. slides, and it just didn't work. They, I mean, they could describe what the image is, but they didn't know the purpose. So that just didn't work. That was a really bad idea. <laughs> Oh, I see. I see. So here's a car, but we don't know why it's been. I see. I yeah. see. Uh, we have a, a question from um, uh, Marjorie uh, Bazlugi, uh, who says, what I'm hearing from instructors about them not making their course accessible is, quote, I don't have a student with a documented disability, so I don't have to. <laughs> We've how heard this I, one. <laughs> how do I combat this, especially when the higher ups don't support the instructional designer? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is. It, it is definitely a challenge. Um, I, I usually say you really don't know. You don't know if there's anybody in your course who has a disability because if we did this all right and the course is accessible, you could have a student in your course with a disability, but they just didn't have to disclose their accessibility. They only if, the only reason they would disclose is if they're asking an accommodation. Right. Otherwise, they don't need to. Well, and we also look at this and we say um, captions on a video might not be helpful only to someone with a disability. They right. might be helpful for someone in a loud room. I think my children watch movies with captions on more often than mm -hmm. not. Um, if, if we think of someone accessing courses on a bus or a gym, I've been in, you know, on campus facilities and students are taking their courses on their phones and um, you know, it, it's noisy and they need access. So looking at how these practices can benefit everyone um, and not specifically, this is only for a student with a disability. And as Barbara said, many in many cases, we know that the number of self-disclosures is lower than the, than the number of students who are actually um, who actually have a disability. So there may be a lot more um, individuals in the population. 
And thank you. Uh, Laura Foley mentions it's the curb cut analogy, which I love. That's if you're not familiar with that, anybody, that's when you take a, a curb on a sidewalk or a road and you put a cut into it for a ramp for someone who has mobility disabilities. But it turns out that people who do not have those disabilities benefit a great deal when they're lugging carts or that kind of thing. It's a great analogy, one I'm very fond of. Um, thank you both for the, for the answers. Uh, these questions are just terrific. Uh, Oh, and I, I was thinking, Brian, um, I was thinking about um, AI and the crossovers that we've been talking about. And we have had instances where students take transcripts that are from the lecture recordings, and then they use those with AI to create guided notes for themselves and study guides. So that's something that our faculty members are starting to do. And so you might say, well, the student doesn't need captions. Well, they are using the captions for other purposes as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Um, we have a question about a specific story here. And this comes to us from our friend Andrew Bray at uh, Indiana Tech. And he mentions an interesting business development show, what I just heard about a couple of days ago. Uh, we're requiring, uh, we were acquiring electronic books from Access Text, who just closed unexpectedly. Might anyone know of a similar provider? Also, could the fellow who just spoke of the bookstores give that name again? Andrew, that's uh, Benentech, and I can put you in touch with him if you want. So what's what's the deal with Access Source or Access Text? What happened with them? And is there anybody else that we should we should consider instead? Not familiar with Access Text. I'm not either. Okay, well, they, maybe they, somebody in the, in the please anyone in the uh, in the chat who's had experience and you know raise your hand if uh, if you'd like to join us on stage to say more about that. Uh, while people are thinking about that, uh, while people are working on that, let me ask uh, or let me pose a different question. And this is oh gosh, I'm I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting this right. The Arifol Hokshinil from the University of Manitoba. It's always good to have more and more Canadian friends. I think um, asks this. Quality Matters has a general standard on accessibility and usability. Do you recommend accessibility and usability review to enhance accessibility? I'm not sure I understand. Well, um, um, the, stand, the specific review standards are for the review of content. Oh, OK. Well, that might be that might be an answer then. Um, please. Uh, um, uh, Arful, if you'd like to uh, yeah. expand on your question, uh, please feel free to. Um, but um, uh, yeah, there, there are, I think, seven specific review standards under that general standard eight on um, accessibility and usability. And if, if think of them as criteria or a checklist, and you know, if you would want to review all those standards as you look at your course. That's a and I would say that Brenda, I know Brenda Boyd wrote the chapter on the evolution of the Quality Matters rubric um, for the book and really explored how that standard has grown over time and been expanded um, to be more comprehensive and more detailed. So um, as Barbara mentioned, it has a lot more, um, it, it, it does provide a, a more comprehensive checklist to ensure that the material is, is accessible. Very good. Very good. Uh, in, in the chat and in direct messages, people have recommended Bookshare.org uh, as an alternative. And Ray, you, you posted that. Uh, you that was from our colleague, page. Michael. Well, I'm glad that we've got that. I'm glad that we've got that in as an alternative. Um, so thank you for the question, um, uh, Andrew. And uh, we'll try and follow up and find out more of what's happened with that, because that's, that's, that's not a happy story. Um, uh, we have, uh, let's see, we're, we're down to about six minutes, and I'll make sure people have a chance to ask the, the questions they have. Um, and um, uh, I actually did want to put in one question while people are still thinking and their, their brains are still smoking. Uh, one question is, roughly what proportion of students today has some form of disability that reduces their access to digital content? Uh, I think in, in, in your book, I saw several different figures who were sitting uh, 8%, 9%. Um, is, is that where we are right now about? So we're, we're going from, you know, sort of national numbers, but 19% of undergraduate students is what the current figures indicate. 19%? Mm -hmm. yep. um, 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 yeah. Wow. And that's the National Center for Education Statistics. 
Well, that's that's the gold standard. And that doesn't include graduate level students. And oftentimes our graduate students aren't as well connected to campus resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good. So one in five. I mean, that's a huge number. That's an enormous number of people. Uh, well, thank you. And, and so and what are the major leading disabilities? So we have blindness, we have color blindness. We also have, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact phrase, uh, low visibility. Um, uh, are, are there others that we should know about for this? Well, the most common um, disabilities that are reported to the Disability Services Office are the cognitive disabilities. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. more prominent than the physical disabilities, which are the, you know, the mm -hmm. vision and motor. Mm -hmm. But that would be, well, I mean, it could be ADHD. I mean, it could be dys dyslexia. Um, mm -hmm. I, well, I can't remember what it's called, but the dyslexia for, for numbers. Um, dyscalculia? Yes. Dyscalculia? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that those are all, I, I mean, there are probably a dozen different disabilities that are, relate to cognitive issues. Okay. Well, thank you. That That helps me. Um, in the in the chat, uh, Paula had this uh, point of good news. SUNY, that's the State University of New York system, instituted the Electronic Information Technology Accessibility Policy, or EITA, a few years ago. Now, each campus has a designated EITA officer to assist with awareness and compliance. Which, that's great news. That's a lot of people. That's about 63, 66 people. That's a lot of people. Uh, it's a major step. Um, so uh, 64, thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, uh, Bobby Myatt mentions there are a lot of neurodivergent di disabilities. Good, good point. Um, and uh, Brenda Boyd uh, sequences that. Stephen Crawford adds motor control. Paula adds autism. Um, thank you very much. Um, and Laura Foley says that ADHD has the highest prevalence. Uh, and Bobby Myatt cautions us that they're pulling these numbers from those that identify as ADA. So the number is likely still higher than that. Well, I, I'm curious if, if I could, uh, looking ahead a bit, uh, what happens to a campus that takes everything that you recommend very seriously? So they've got uh, lots of staff whose job it is to do this. There's a university or college-wide policy that does this. Faculty are getting lots of support in, in, in making their materials accessible. And let's just hit fast forward on this video. What, what does that campus look like, say, five years from now? How would it be different from the campus today? This is a great question, Brian. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a stumper. Um... You know, at the University of Pittsburgh, I really don't know if it would be all that different. We, I think we've been pretty proactive in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion as, as well as, you know, um, accessibility. We have, we have a policy. In fact, there's a chapter in the book where the person who was leading the, that initiative um, talked about, you know, how she led a, a committee and develop the access the digital accessibility policy at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so, I I really think I don't really think things would be that much different. I think we're just going to continue with what what we're doing. I, every all the instructional designers are, are are certainly well trained in accessibility. I I don't come across any faculty member who ever tells me they that they think this is a waste of time. You know, it's usually the opposite. Now, it's because they have support. I think if faculty were on their own doing this, it would be probably a different story. But because mm -hmm. they're working with an instructional designer, they, they always emphasize how much they want to have their courses accessible to all students. I think it would become second nature. So a lot of the practices that, mm -hmm. that you, you put into practice, um, they become second nature. So when we're designing a, a course or a document or a, 
an artifact, a learning object, you know, we're already thinking about these things. So if we look at what would the future look like and everybody's been trained and everyone has um, access to all of the tools that are needed and all of the content is 100% accessible, I mean, the material would all be accessible because everybody would be utilizing these practices on the daily um, as part of their routine as they develop course materials. And I like to think that we would see fewer reports um, from disability services of materials that were inaccessible or students who were experiencing barriers and had to wait. There's often a delay when materials are made accessible. There's a delay between when the students need that material and when it's actually created in an accessible format. So I like to think that in the future, all students would have access to their materials mm -hmm. at the same time so that they would be equally as successful. Oh, very nice. We had a, we had a terrific practice a couple years ago in our office. Um, there was somebody in the disability services office who was blind and did use a screen reader. He had mm -hmm. a nine month contract. So we were able to take him for the summer months our, our pit online team was able to, um, you know, offer him another contract for the summer months and bring him in. And he sat down with every single instructional designer on the team and he showed them what their courses looked like. And he, he navigated oh, their courses with, with a screen reader. Fantastic. And there's nothing that that's, that's what makes it personal. And that's when you really yeah. realize, you know, I look what I did here. I created this barrier for a student and I didn't mean to, and all I had to do was, you know, uh, change the colors or, you know, just, just, you know, something, hopefully something that is doable by the instructional design team. But I think that was really a wonderful thing that we did. And I really think it, that got a lot of buy-in from the team. Oh, that's great. What a, I, I'm, I'm afraid friends, we're just past the top of the hour now, so we have to wrap things up, but I think it's wonderful to end Barbara. It's such a great, uh, great high note. Uh, let, let me ask the two of you, what are the best ways to keep up with your work uh, on mentorship and accessibility? How can we find you? <laughs> I guess the Google, <laughs> through Google, but we, um, we try to publish in sources that are open and free so that there isn't a oh, subscription nice. um, mm -hmm. generally. So typically a Google search will, will call up our current work. I would say that their quality matters also has a LinkedIn site and uh, you know, anything Good. we do would be, would be shared on the LinkedIn site. So that might be another way to keep up with us. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, let, let me just conclude then by saying thank you both so much uh, for sharing so much of your experience, your knowledge, your work, and above all, your your attitude, your your optimism, your love for the learning, and also your desire to keep learning and keep on learning. I think the two of you are just so admirable. Thank you both for joining well, us. Well, thank Thanks you. for well, inviting us today and for everyone who came and attended and all of these fantastic questions. Now, these are great questions. Well, let, again, Ray and, and Barbara, please, when you get uh, your next round of publications out, let us know so we can bring you back. Barbara, there's no way of escaping. We've got you. <laughs> Thank you. Barbara will never retire. No, That's right. no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. And take care. Be safe. All right. But bye bye. Bye. Everybody else, don't don't run away yet. Let me just point, let me just wrap things up by saying thank you all for the questions you heard from our guests, how good they were, and I can tell you that as well. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues of accessibility in different ways, we can do this on social media. You can see here a few of the different uh, versions of that. Just use the hashtag FTTE so we can find them. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including some on accessibility and uh, digital materials, just go to the forum archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, thank you again for all the consideration. This has been a, a terrific session. I'm looking forward to sharing it uh, asynchronously uh, soon. I hope everybody's well. I hope you stay safe. And uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, we've got some spring. Please enjoy it. Um, until then, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.